St. Anselm College released the first poll from its new survey center last week. It reveals what would appear to be an uphill battle for the GOP in the congressional midterm elections, with Democrats leading Republicans by almost 12 points among registered voters on a generic ballot. One of the candidates sailing into that apparent headwind is Eddie Edwards running for Congress in the 1st District. Eddie, thanks for joining us today. Good morning, Adam. We thanks for having me. Time. Appreciate it. So we know that the energy of the conservative grassroots is always there. Uh, whether or not it comes out to the polls is another question, yeah. but are you worried at all by the trend lines here where we see Democrats in those state house races uh, racking up the victories and now these polls that, that definitely show a challenge ahead for Republicans. No, I'm not worried about that. I, I think in uh, New Hampshire, uh, we're going to be judged as individuals. And so I'm not worried about the polls at all. I think the grassroots energy is there. I think uh, folks are going to turn out and, and vote. And uh, the energy I'm feeling when I'm out campaigning is great. So I'm not worried about the polls at all. There are some mixed results there. We see the president with very high uh, unfavorability ratings, but then Governor Chris Sununu, conversely, with high favorability ratings. He's um, done a fantastic job. Th there you go. Yeah. Uh, but I guess when you extrapolate from that, um, you're going to be running as an ally of Chris Sununu, of course, but on the federal level. But are you going to be running as an ally of Donald Trump? I'm going to be running as an individual. I'm running as an individual. People are going to grade me based upon what I'm bringing to Washington. I want to talk about character, integrity. That's what I'm going to be bringing to Washington. You know, our, our president is trying. He's not a perfect man, as I said before. Our governor is trying. He's not a perfect man. They both are working as hard as they can for the American people. They're going to have detractors. They're going to have supporters. And I'm running as an individual with a message that resonates with the voters in Congressional District 1. Uh, last week, uh, we know the president can obviously say things that upset people. Uh, last week, the president said something to the effect of, I think I have the quote here when it comes to gun policy, take the guns first, go through due process second. What was your yes. reaction when you heard that? Let, let me say this. First of all, what happened there in Parkland, California, uh, Florida, uh, is sad. It's tragic. Uh, I'm a parent. You're a parent. Um, you know, I, I can't imagine um, receiving a call saying that my baby's not coming home to me. Uh, but I've received calls where that pain is felt over the phone. And there's no easy way to address those things. And I think what the president is looking for, what most people in this country are looking for, is the answers. But there's one thing that we cannot do, is negotiate our Bill of Rights, our Constitution. They are not for negotiation. And I, and I, I, don't, I reject the notion that we can't protect our children without destroying our Constitution. We can do it. Generations, generations before us have done it consistently. This generation has to st stand up and do it. If we have leaders who are elected who cannot follow the Constitution and protect our citizens, then we have the wrong people in Washington. Should we be arming teachers? Listen, I, I, again, I, I think you saw real time how difficult policing is in this country. Uh, police officers have uh, faced these type of challenges repeatedly, right? We've, we've seen peace, police officers called uh, stormtroopers, racists, uh, bigots, uh, now cowards, uh, now people who are trigger happy. Policing is a very difficult job. They do it, we did it, I, I did it, we, you do it all the time. And training th those type of officers to meet those challenges is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, I'm not supportive of arming teachers. I'm supportive of arming uh, uh, hardening our schools and making sure that our children are safe. And I think there's creative ways of doing that without putting someone in a position who we're training to do something they're not really equipped to do. Uh, because you have a familiarity with guns, because you uh, may feel like you want to do that, provide that service, doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're the most appropriate person to do that. You know, when you're going to carry a firearm, like I did for most of my career, you want to make sure you're dealing with someone who has the mental capability of doing that, carrying out that responsibility, and is able to carry out that responsibility. We saw a, a sheriff's deputy there who let a lot of people down that day, didn't properly engage. And uh, I don't know all the circumstances are in that case, but I do know a lot of people were let down. And this is someone who's been trained over 30 years to do this job. So I think we have to, we have to think carefully about these situations. But one thing we have to do is to make sure that we're not impeding constitutional rights to achieve safety. Switching gears here a little yeah. bit, also in Washington, we're now talking about protective tariffs again. In some ways, it feels like we're dusting off the history books here uh, when we talk about tariffs on steel and aluminum, I believe the president yes. is, is proposing. Um, are you supportive of protecting those industries with tariffs? Yeah, I, I, I am supportive of trade. I think it's important. Uh, you know, we, I think we have uh, 6.5 million people who work in the industry manufacturing side 
uh, of the equation. There's about a, um, a little smaller number who are in the steel business and aluminum business. But, but I, th I think there's a, there's a balance here. I understand the, the president's desire to help steel companies and aluminum companies in our country. But also there's a balance of people who are using that raw material to in automobiles, and them using it in appliances, and a whole host of uh, things that are going on there. So I'm much more supportive of trade but not trade that we, we're getting a short end of the stick either. So we have to be very careful about this. And we open that book up and suddenly a lot of other industries are going to be coming forward and saying, hey, why not me? Of course. I, I, I mean, we have to be very careful about that. And I think like most policy, you see this is the uh, president's first stab at it, uh, laying out the uh, what he believes to be the uh, appropriate thing from his perspective. He's talked about that. Uh, but a lot of us are concerned about making sure that our other industry members aren't punished or put at a disadvantage. Okay, a little bit of an aside here that'll get to another question, but you were in law enforcement for a long time. What's the best way to break up a fight? Well, I can, I can, I can tell you, I, I've been in uh, many fights in my life, you know, and, and uh, the first time I saw, uh, experienced a loss of a classmate, was 18. I was 18 years old. My uh, friend Scooter uh, lost his life on Glowin Avenue in Atlanta, Georgia, over a gold necklace, wow. right? So I understand violence from a firsthand experience. And there's no easy way to break up a fight. But what we have to remember in this country, we, have a, we need a common bond, a common understanding. If you start to look at the fact that uh, before you reach the age of 18 in the United States of America, most young people will see over 200,000 images of violent, violence taking place on television. 1.1 million children are on psychiatric medication in our country under the age of five. So when we start talking about violence, we, start, we need to start to talk about families, family values, two-parent households, moms and dads. Uh, those, are, those are important qualities in building strong people in our, in our nation. I think New Hampshire's done a great job of that. You know, we're still the safest state in the country, uh, and we do a good job here working as a community. And one area where we do have a, a potential Donnybrook is on the other side of this race, and the Democrats, uh, they've got potentially almost nine candidates now. There are eight official, and one more is looking at it. Um, you and your primary opponent both took time out last week uh, to go after one person who has joined the race. That's Bernie Sanders' son, uh, Levy Sanders. Uh, what, I guess, and both of you were pointed about your criticism in terms of his policies. You were seeing this, this idea that he is running from Claremont in the first CD as sort of the, the borderless nature uh, of what you see as socialistic policies. What's the danger in his candidacy well, outside the district? Yeah, well, you know, I think asking someone questions is not attacking them, right? So we, we want to know the truth. And, and I think uh, uh, Levi Sanders uh, has decided to run in a district that he doesn't live in. Uh, I, I think that's a slap into the face particularly people in his, in his party, they, they should be concerned about that. I, th I think uh, there's a lot of room to ask questions if you had a slate of seven candidates already. Uh, you, we saw that the national uh, DNC uh, gave money to the state uh, to expand their outreach, and I'm, I'm assuming they're looking for candidates to run in this district. Um, that says a lot about the candidates they had on the slate already, uh, to me. Well, I'm, I'm focused on my race. I'm focused on delivering a, a con, uh, conservative message, a unifying message, a message that talks about character and integrity. Uh, I question his motivations for running in Congressional District 1, a district he doesn't live in. Uh, there were, there were uh, candidates who were qualified uh, already running. Uh, what's the motivation of running in CD1? Um, that's all. It, Simple question. His father's presidential campaign was dinged by the FEC last week for sort of working with uh, Australian nationals yeah. in that uh, 2016 election. They will pay a fine there, as will the Australians. Uh, this sort of fits in also to the, the, the Russia interference question as well. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, are you concerned about foreign nationals coming in and perhaps getting involved in this uh, CD1 race? And also, have you hardened any of the defenses of your campaign, email, uh, cybersecurity, things like that? Oh, sure. I mean, we're, we're always concerned about those challenges, right? Uh, making sure that people aren't uh, interfering in our elections process. That's a concern. But with uh, Senator Bernie Sanders, he's agreed to pay a fine for having a foreign government interfere in our presidential election, helping his, his campaign. So that's, that's a fact. Uh, Russia, we know, has interfered from a cyber standpoint, and that's concerning. But I'll remind people also, Russia was accused of sowing seeds of discontent amongst the American population. 
We have to do a better job of not doing it ourselves, sowing seeds of discontent amongst our own citizens in this country. You know, it's, it's shocking that a foreign nation knows that if you start to talk about race, you can get Americans to fight with each other. If you talk about sexual orientation, gender, finances, you can pick a fight between Americans. That we have to harden ourselves against. You and I can't fight with one another because someone simply throws out a, uh, a card on the table and says, now you guys start to fight. Uh, that's the type of stuff we have to end. Uh, so that's what I'm concerned about what we do as citizens to, to one another. All right, Eddie Edwards, yeah, thank thanks you. for your time. Thanks for stopping thank by you. on Sunday, and we'll see you out there on the campaign trail. Thanks.